Hey guys, we're here um, and we're going to be talking about safety and sanitation in the kitchen. Though we're not going to physically be at the kitchen at school, these are still practices that you can um, do at your home kitchen. So first we're going to talk about um, making it safe and keeping it sanitary. So sanitation is a process of maintaining a clean and healthy environment. So that's not just wiping counters down with a damp cloth and calling it a day. W uh, with hot soapy water um, and a cloth and then afterward using some type of sanitizing spray with it as well. Okay, sometimes at home you guys will use your own sprays. Um, you guys can make your own sprays that are safe. Uh, and at school we have one that we, we started to use. So foodborne illnesses where illness is caused by eating contaminated food. Uh, if you've ever heard of food poisoning, that's essentially what a foodborne illness is. Um, they can be common if you're not practicing safe food uh, handling skills. And so we're gonna figure out how to try to prevent that to the best of our ability. So food safety involves four basic steps, clean, separate, cook, and chill. So when we talk about clean, we're talking about keeping our utensils and work area clean, um, paying attention to personal cleanliness, making sure that you're washing your hands for at least 20 seconds, uh, making sure that if you work outside or work with chemicals um, that tend to want to stick into like your nail beds, that you're scrubbing that and getting those out as well. You want to wash hands with warm and, uh, water and soap, especially after touching raw meat in your face or eggs. Uh, don't touch food with your hands if you can avoid it. Do not lick fingers or cooking utensils. If you want to taste test your food, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can get a spoon, taste test it, make sure you don't burn yourself, and there's no raw ingredients in it, which could potentially give you a foodborne illness. Um, and then you can go and actually wash that uh, utensil to use it again. If you don't want to keep washing the same thing over and over and over again, you can always get disposable. Just keep in mind you're adding to the landfills. So wash dishes with warm soapy water and then make sure that we wash fruits and vegetables under running water. You want to get off any dirt or anything that's been able to kind of hide out in there during the processing of from the farm to the uh, kitchen table. So talk about separate. We talk about keep raw, keeping raw foods away from our cooked foods. So that's if you had um, a, you steamed a bunch of vegetables and you put them in the fridge for some reason. Maybe you're going to use them for later on. Um, you want to make sure that you don't place those near raw meat um, or underneath raw meat on the shelves in case the juices were to leak down and, and do what we call cross contamination. You want to use separate cutting boards for animal products and produce, um, or you can wash the board after animal products have been used. Your safest bet, though, is to go ahead and use two separate boards that you label and know for a fact one is for animal products only, one is for produce only, and you keep that routine up. Raw meat products should be kept on the bottom shelf of a fridge. I kind of mentioned it earlier, whenever raw meat, um, if it can drip sometimes, and like that, you want any of those raw drippings on any of your food to uh, contaminate that. And then produce should be kept um, on the first or second shelf in the fridge to avoid cross-contamination. When we're talking about cook, we know that bacteria is killed by high heat. Um, this is not like your warm atmosphere, your warm in, uh, temperatures in the room or anything like that. We're talking about when you're adding um, things to like a hot skillet or you're adding it to the oven. Okay, that's extremely high temperature. So we let bacteria is killed by that. Um, use a food thermometer to be sure foods are cooked to the recommended temperatures. The different types of meat require different types of internal temperatures. Most are anywhere from 155 to about 165. Um, and then fish is the only kind of specialty one where it's actually 145. Uh, but you got to be careful with fish because our danger zone, which is 140 degrees, the, the top end of it's 140. Fish is only five degrees above that um, to be considered safe. So you got to be, you got to make sure you follow that 145. We know that we should not be partially cooking meats, poultry, or fish. We're really good about that with poultry and fish. However, we do get uh, most of our meats cooked to, to order. So if you're a person that likes medium rare, do know that every time you do that, you're taking a risk um, of potentially getting a foodborne illness. Whenever we are um, baking meats, you wanna set the oven to at least 325 degrees. Um, after you've cooked everything, let's say you have food sitting out, you want to make sure that you keep it hot um, to above at least 140, so it's above that danger zone. And then we're going to reheat leftovers to at least 165 degrees. When we're talking about chill, um, this is storing your frozen and refrigerated foods promptly. So that's as soon as you get home after you've gone to the grocery store, those should be the first few um, items that you put away. 
You want to make sure that you also wrap foods properly for storage. A lot of times we just kind of loosely wrap things, want to toss them in the fridge, and then we wonder why they're going bad so quick. If you use proper um, food storage and you properly wrap everything, it can last a lot longer and be safer to eat. The best way to thaw food is to do it in the refrigerator. You can do it in the microwave. It's your choice, but the best, best, best way is in the refrigerator. We do not um, thaw it at room temperature. I know it's very common. I know our parents, I know my mom still does it all the time, where she'll take food out of the freezer. She'll take meat out of the freezer. She puts it in the sink and she goes to work for the day. By the time she comes home, it's completely thawed out. Do you know that it's been sitting in the danger zone for so long, for at least eight hours, that you run a risk of, of getting that foodborne illness and getting sick from the food if it's not cooked properly. So the best way is to thaw it in the refrigerator, take it out the night before, um, put it in the refrigerator, go to work, and then by the time you come home, it should be good enough for you to use. You can also thaw food by running it under cool running water. Uh, just know that you should be rotating it constantly to, to safely thaw it out without bringing it up to a higher temperature. Uh, anytime that we're going to marinate foods, you should be marinating them in the fridge and make sure it is covered. Never leave perishable foods out over two hours, which is foods that can spoil. Um, and then keep cold foods below 40 degrees. So these are the food safe temperatures that we're going to be looking at. Um, we know that zero degrees to 32 degrees Fahrenheit freezes, <coughs> excuse me, the, the freezing temperatures pauses the growth of bacteria. Bacteria is still technically in existence. However, um, whenever we freeze it, it kind of puts it on a temporary hold. It moves at such a tiny, 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 tiny rate. Um, that's why we can end up having food in our freezer for, you know, four months or so and it'd be okay. Now you're probably going to get freezer burn and you're going to lose some nutrition in there. And the taste is definitely out the window at that point. But the freezing pauses the growth of bacteria. 32 to 40 degrees, uh, it slows the growth of bacteria, but it does not stop it or kill it. This is like your refrigerator, okay? So it's above freezing because, you know, 32 degrees is freezing. So it's going to slow the growth of bacteria. So this is why you can put food in the refrigerator, and if it's in there for too long, you'll start seeing mold and other bacteria growing on it. So do know that it's still in existence. It's basically become a little bit more active. So make sure you wrap it properly to store it a little bit longer. 40 to 140, this is definitely one you should know right here. This is the danger zone, and we know that bacteria grows rapidly during this range. It's 100 degrees uh, within this range, so it's a lot of room for error, which is why we want to make sure that we thaw things properly. And then cooked foods, uh, 40 to, I'm sorry, 140 to 165, cooked foods can be kept in this range for a maximum of two hours, um, and they should be rotated through. They should be uh, mixed and everything to make sure that the bottom isn't hot and the top is getting cold. And then 165 and above, uh, most meats must be cooked in this range to kill bacteria. So to prevent injuries at the stove, we want to make sure that we are wiping up spills right away. Uh, so if water spills, ingredient spills, or anything like that, you clean them up right away. You dispose of it and you wash your hands. We do know that flour is more slippery than water because it's such a light powder. It actually compacts up into the tractions of your sh into the tracks of your shoes and takes away all traction. So you want to make sure that you're cleaning up things right away, even if it's a tiny spill. Still clean it up to be safe. We want to make sure we close drawers and cabinets before you walk away. Um, that way people aren't running into them, knocking into them, or tripping over them. And you want to unplug all portable appliances before wiping them down. Preventing injuries at the stove. You want to make sure you turn pot handles towards the center of the stove. Don't leave metal spoons in hot foods. Uh, lift lids away from you to avoid steam burns. You want to make sure that that doesn't get up and, and actually start burning your face or anything like that. Um, keep flammable items away from the burners. Always use pot holders. You shouldn't be using damp towels or anything like that because that can still burn you. Never leave the oven door open and walk away. And then lastly, never put water or flour on a grease fire. You should be either using baking soda or you should be using um, a fire extinguisher. And speaking of a fire extinguisher, there is a proper way to use one. Um, we have two of them located in the school in the kitchen. Uh, there's a big, large silver one, and there's a small little red one that looks like this. Um, they all have a dial on it, much, much like you see right here. The green is basically saying that this extinguisher is still good to go. They are checked at least once a year by the fire marshal to make sure that they are in proper working order.
So in order for this to work, um, in order for the actual inside chemicals to come out and put the fire out, there is a pin right here that sits. And what you do is you're going to pull that pin out and you're going to yank that pin pretty hard because it's actually attached uh, by a little plastic ring. And so you want to make sure you can break that ring off while you're pulling the pin out or else the pin won't come out. So there's a pin about right here and that stops the handle from being used improperly. So pull that pin, the handle can now be used. You're going to pop the hose off. You're going to aim at the base of the fire. You're going to then squeeze this handle and then you're going to move the hose and sweep it side to side. And that will ensure that you're entirely putting the fire out. And that right there is what you need to know um, for basic safety and sanitation in the kitchen. And we're going to go into more details about foodborne illnesses and knife safety later on. So thanks for watching, guys.